I say welcome to all of those listening in through Facebook Live as well. Glad you could join us tonight. We're all united together in spirit and in truth, worshiping God. Any announcements you'd like to share with us? Yes, ma'am. Continues on. Yes, All right, so mine's clear, Brother David. Would you lead us in prayer? Sure. Let's pray, Son of Father, Lord. We just thank you for this day, and we thank you for your many blessings upon us, Lord. And Lord, we just pray tonight that we hear the election and we hear the results, Lord. And we just ask, Lord, that your will be done. Just give us understanding, Lord, through this, and just help us to see your vision for this country, Lord. Father, we just pray for all those who have been mentioned tonight, those who are sick.
sick, those who are suffering, Lord, especially those with cancer and those going through surgeries and procedures, Lord. And we just lift them up. And especially for those who've lost loved ones, Lord, who are grieving. And we ask you to just comfort them and give them strength. And uh, just be with all those tonight, Lord, that couldn't be here for whatever reason. And, Lord, we just uh, lift the pastor up tonight, Lord, as he brings our study. Just open our hearts and minds to your word, Lord. And uh, just speak to those, Lord, who are watching via social media as well, Lord. If anyone here or via social media doesn't know you as Savior, we ask you that tonight would be that night. If you would just press something upon their heart, Lord, that would bring them to you. And, Father, um, again, we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we finished up the book of Acts, and if you wasn't here, uh, we have completed it, and so now we're going to be doing some independent studies, and after the first of the year, maybe we'll jump on another a longer study, but I was contemplating and praying about what we should be studying on. Have y'all noticed when you walk into department stores, all the Christmas decorations already out, been out about three weeks, almost a month now? We had the Baptist men meeting the other night. And as I went home, I was flipping through, uh, well, not flipping, I was mashing the button through different channels. I always listen to the Christian stations, but I said, let me just see what's on. I was trying to catch anything about the news, but guess what I heard? Christmas songs. <laughs> I said, well, let me go ahead and listen to some. And it's 2020, let me go ahead and get some cheer up. But, uh, so I, I listened to Christmas songs on the way home. Well, they got me to thinking. It seemed like our culture is jumping right over Thanksgiving going into Christmas. Uh -huh. And so all of this month, every Wednesday night, we're going to be doing uh, some studies on thankfulness, bringing out different scriptures on being thankful. And so uh, just for the month of November, leading into Thanksgiving. So tonight, one of the scriptures that has been placed upon my heart is one of my favorite scriptures dealing with thankfulness is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. So let's turn there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. This is a very a short verse. In fact, uh, this is what it says. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Our Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings now upon this study. Uh, may we be filled with your Holy Spirit. May he lead us and guide us in all spiritual truth. I pray, Lord, by the time we are ready to go home, we can say it's been good to be in God's house, whether we are here physically or here emotionally and spiritually, looking in through Facebook. We give you the glory and the praise in all things in Jesus' name. Amen. The Scottish minister, Alexander White, was known for his uplifting prayers in the pulpit. And to be honest, he got on some of the people's nerves because he was so uplifting all the time, so upbeat. One particular night when everybody gathered, the weather was so stormy and so dark and so gloomy, one of the people of the church said, well, the preacher ain't going to be able to find nothing good to thank God for tonight. And just as soon as he started his prayer, this is what the preacher said. We thank thee, O oh God, that the weather is not always like this. <laughs> and so he, he had learned to try to find something good in every situation. You and I should take on that same attitude. Because life is tough with his twists and turns. We got a lot of things we go through that maybe others don't even realize, but because we serve the same God who's the God of the universe, he's the same God that's with us right here in the here and now, in everything we face in this present life. God always has his reasons for things we don't understand. God always has his motives whenever he does things that we just can't comprehend. God's got a purpose for everything that goes on in our life. It may not make sense to you and me, but it certainly makes sense to God. Amen. He is always trying to do things for our best. Having said that, just finishing the book of Acts with the Apostle Paul, and he is the one who wrote the book to 1 Thessalonians, how is it that Paul could say, in everything, give thanks? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. We've read Paul's life. We know his story. We, we know about uh, since he became a Christian, he was turned on. He was shunned by the Christian community. He was talked about. He was apprehended. He was beaten. He was uh, uh, left for dead, stoned. 
And many times over, every single day, he faced danger year after year. How could he say, in everything, give thanks? Well, let's read his own testimony. Here's what it says in 1 Thessalonians 11, verses 23 through 28. 1 Corinthians, I mean, uh, verse, chapter 11, verse 23 through 28. That's 1 Corinthians, let me say that again. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often. Of the Jews five times received out forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. Uh, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen. In perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. And so here's a man who dealt with strife, who dealt with people who turned on him, who dealt with isolation, uh, Christians who persecuted him uh, to the point they just shunned him. Uh, they didn't understand him. And so we see that uh, of all the people, certainly it wouldn't be Paul saying, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. But we find that there is. There are several things you need to know about this particular verse. First of all, it says in everything, not for everything. I mean, there's a lot of things that, that go on and I don't thank God for uh, because of, I wouldn't want to go through them, but I found that I must thank God in everything I face. And so we're all in the same boat when it comes to that. Uh, remember that God is always at work in our lives, trying to bring out the very best for each and every one of us. And because of that, Sometimes we go through good times. Sometimes we go through hard times. And a lot of times we wonder, where are you, God, when we're going through a hard time? That just may not be the case. It may be something God wants us to learn, and he's trying to teach us. Let me uh, share with you a story. Uh, I didn't find the story until tonight, so I didn't have an opportunity to write it down. But uh, see if you can identify the story. The year was 1974. Let me turn it sideways. That would be a bit better. It was one of those trial of your faith, work of patience experience for Sharon and I. And the man who's writing this is named Tracy. We were living in Apple Valley, California. I had entered into a partnership with an old friend building swimming pools in the high desert. Things seemed to be going well and sales were terrific and customers were satisfied. We were floating on air. Then came the end of the building season. We had nothing to worry about. We had a half dozen pools under construction and a bank account full of money. Plenty, we thought, to get us through the winter with ease. Sharon and I had started a gospel group with another couple, June and Dale Wade. We had a pretty fair gospel sound, country gospel sound. We named the group the country congregation. I wrote most of the music for the group and secured a recording contract with Calvary Records in Nashville. While the group was developing, I noticed something disturbing in our pool business. The bookkeeper kept telling us to spend more money, but our bank account was shrinking faster than our pools were finishing. The wholesale price index was increasing rapidly and with inflation. My partner kept increasing prices to compensate for the cost increases, but something was not right. I approached him on the matter, and he was completely frustrated with the whole situation, and I realized he had hit the wall of burnout. He handed me all the books and contracts and said, Here, you figure it out. I closed myself in the office for the weekend. I went over and over the figures and laid it out on a spreadsheet. The figures looked bad. I calculated that when all of our construction was finished, 
We would be $22,000 in the hole. I couldn't believe it. My partner threw his hands up. He was tired and frustrated. Let's bankrupt it, he said. I didn't feel it was the right thing to do. All right, then. If you want to try to save it, be my guest. You can have it all. He drew up a paper and turned everything over to me. Office equipment, the truck, his car, and a $22,000 deficit. Sharon and I prayed, and boy, did we pray. What would we do now? It would be six months until the building season would return. I had pools to complete and no money to do it with. God help us. We didn't have much, but what little we had, I had used to buy into this seemingly wonderful business. But now, wow. In the midst of the turmoil, I awakened from a troubled sleep one night. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. A tune was echoing in my troubled brain. I picked up a tablet and a pencil and began to write. Life is easy when you're up on the mountain and you've got peace of mind like you've never known. But when things change and you're down in the valley, don't lose faith for you're never alone. Thank you, Lord, I prayed, for being my God in the valley. The chorus came, the God on the mountain is still the God in the valley. When things go wrong, he'll make them right. And all it took about 30 minutes, I again prayed, thank you, Lord, and then settled back down to sleep. Morning came, breakfast and prayer time came. Lord, show us your will. I went off to work. Shortly after arriving at the office, the phone rang. Mr. Dark, could you please help us? I grabbed my briefcase and went to see the people who had called their son was a gifted athlete, but had been in a motorcycle accident and was paralyzed from the waist down. His doctor had recommended a swimming pool for the therapy, and the young man needed one in order to walk again. I began the process of de designing and building a pool for them. A few days later, another call came. Mr. Dark, could you come talk to me about a pool? So, through the off-season, we ended up selling and building 12 pools in all at a time when no one else was building pools. The building season came and all of a sudden we were able to finish all of our construction and eliminate all of our debts. We were free and clear without having to bankrupt the business. God had taken us through the valley. Amen. The song God on the Mountain was first recorded in 1975 on the Country Congregation's first album. Later it was recorded by the Weatherfords, Mark Gray, the Ambassadors, Jim and Wanda Beard, the Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College Choral, and several other part-time groups. Thirteen years later, it is recorded by the McCaneys from Clinton, Tennessee. Hal Spencer from Man of Music called on me uh, September the 10th, 1988. I remember the date exactly because it was right after my first Sunday as the new pastor of Albury First Baptist Church in Albury, California. Tracy, he said, your song is number 10 on the charts. What song? What chart? Was my reply. The McCamish recorded God on the Mountain and it's number 10 in the singing news chart. I was dumbfounded. Who are the McCamish? I asked. He explained and then played a song for me over the phone. The sound quality was terrible as we lived up in the mountains and were still operating on an old copper phone wire. That's number 10, was my reaction. My initial thought was that it was just a fluke. I figured someone spent a bunch of promotion money and that it would fade away quickly. October came and the song went to number one. For five months it remained at number one. And during the fifth month, the song drew more radio points than any other song in gospel music history. Since then, God on the Mountain has been recorded hundreds of times by artists such as Linda Randall, J. Kess, Jesse Dixon, John Starnes, and the list goes on and on. It has been translated into several languages as well. This simple little song, comprised of 72 words and four chords, has been an encouragement to thousands of people. Thank you, Lord, for the mountains and the valleys and the gifts we are given to share with others. Tracy Dart. So, for your listening pleasure tonight, we're going to listen to that song now that you know the story of how it was written. 
Off your lightly anyway. Off your lightly anyway. And I felt it to be God on the mountain too. Let me try to sing this song for you. God on the mountain. I trust it. Bless you.
Every one of us in here tonight has dealt with a hardship at some point in our life. We may be dealing with a hardship tonight, and you at home, you just may be dealing with something that nobody else knows about that you do, and God does. Whatever it is that's happened in the past that you've had to dealt with or deal with, and whatever is happening even now that you are coping with, God is using this to make us better Christians. We learn from what we go through, and we trust God in it. I have been amazed through the many years of pastoring. I've been pastoring, what, 28 and a half years, almost 29 years now. And many times I go to people's homes thinking I'm going to make them feel better. I'm going to do something or say something that they will be blessed by reading the scripture. But in effect, I was the one that felt better when I left. I was the one that was touched, and I was the one that was blessed by being in their presence and how they trusted God. I could tell you, the saints of God, many years over, Betty Shepherd in my first church, an older widow woman whose arthritis was so bad, her fingers absolutely were riddled and the knuckles were so huge, and all she did every day was crochet. And she crocheted all year long to give presents to her children and to those that she loved. That was her blessing to others that she would do for them. I remember Steve Malthus, uh, my brotherhood director in the first church. The first time I met Steve, he was in New Hanover Hospital. He had diabetes real bad. He got a scratch on his toe. And through the process of time, they had to cut his toe off. But he kept turning gangrene. They had to take it off at the ankle. Then they had to take it off just below the knee. And they finally took it off right there at the thigh. And after he got healed and well, he'd come back home and, and he started attending church regular. And, and boy, he was a blessing to me. Then he got a cut on the other leg. And the same thing played out. They had to cut his leg off. And it began below the knee and then above the knee. But he still came to church. He played the guitar. What a blessing he was to me and to countless others. I'll never forget when my son had passed away. He made a great big tray of sausage biscuits and brought it to the house for us. That's just the kind of person he was. And the thing is, he started having panic attacks. And anybody's had a panic attack, you know it's pretty terrible. But then his heart went out on him and he finally died of a heart attack. He was only 44 at the time, somewhere in that neighborhood. And so he was just about five years older than me. But I remember he was such a blessing to me in my life. And then many that we have met through the years, and you probably are thinking of people right now that has been a blessing to you, and the hardships they face, but they still continue moving on for the glory of God. You know why? Because they've learned in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. But then, as I mentioned a while ago, we also are able to relate to others when we go through certain things that they go through. Listen to what one of my favorite scriptures as well says. It's in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, these words. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. You know what that verse tells me? We need to thank God for our troubles. Yeah. Huh? We need to thank God for our troubles because our troubles put us in a position to identify with other people going through troubles. Because we go through certain things that other people are going through, we can identify with their hardships. And God can use us uh, to help others to realize that there is a comfort. God comforts us where we are able to go and comfort them who may not be as close to God as you and I are. There are many people who are glorifying God today. Their lives were wrecked by alcohol. Some of you have told me your stories of alcohol. Their life was wrecked by drugs. Some of you have mentioned how drugs have affected your life. Their life was affected by sexual uh, perversion, whether it be pornography or thinking of other men or women when you ought not to. 
and you're already married. And so God can use you and your experiences as you come to God and he forgave you your sin. You can help others who are going through some hard times in life who need to turn to God as well. Some of you are battling sicknesses. Or maybe you have in the past. But God has allowed you. He didn't cause you to have that sickness. But he's allowed you to go through it so you can identify with someone else. And you can help them through their sicknesses. Certainly death has touched all of us in our homes. God has allowed us uh, to be strengthened and comforted through death that we can be there and strengthen and comfort others who are facing death in the home. And so God, he uses us if we're allowed to be used, if we'll allow ourselves to be used. And then here's a final thought. We want to close out tonight in just a few minutes. We know that our troubles are not going to last forever. I posted earlier in the week, in fact, it must have been last week, uh, this phrase, it came to pass. I got a lot of comments on it, a lot of likes. But some of the people, even uh, from back in the Harsville area, not Harsville, but uh, Loris area, one of my closest friends, uh, she died of cancer. Uh, Susan and I, I were real close to her and her husband. And, and one of the phrases we had in common was, it came to pass. Talk about our hardships, our troubles. They don't come to stay, they come to pass. And we would always lean upon each other and talk about it comes to pass. And, and we can say, whatever we go through, it comes to pass. It doesn't come to stay. I heard, I was in the mall one day. It's been many years ago, over at Independence Mall. And I was sitting down. I don't know if I was waiting on Susan or I just, I, I can't hardly believe I'm retired. I don't know why I was sitting down. But I sat down and I heard two women talking about it. And they were talking about one of them's husband had passed away. And she was having a hard time, especially at Christmas. But her brother told her, you need to get over it and move on. It's over with. Get on with your life. And she was trying to tell her sister-in-law that it was, I just can't get over it. It's not something you get over and I was thinking to myself, you're exactly right. Death and the loss of a loved one is not something you get over. It's something you get through. <clears throat> one day at a time you get through it. Amen. But you'll never get over it. And so she was right. I don't know what possessed her brother to be so harsh on her. But she was right. You don't just get over something like that. You have to get through it one day at a time. You and I can say we can thank God for the troubles we go through because they don't come to stay, they come to pass. And I know you say, well, I still got troubles. I still got that ornery brother, ornery sister-in-law, ornery mother-in-law. You know, I used to kid my mother-in-law, uh, that old, I better not could. <laughs> that old 50 song, Mother-in-Law, you ever heard that song? I'm not gonna repeat it, I'm not gonna go on right. <laughs> but either way, we had a kick about it. We always had a, a good time uh, jesting one another. But think about this. If you're suffering tonight, it's not going to always be that way. God's either going to heal you here or he's going to heal you there. But you're going to be healed one day. Uh, you're suffering the loss of a loved one. You're going to be completely healed one day. If it's not here, uh, time has a great healer. You ever heard that phrase? Time is a great healer. And as time moves on, we grow stronger. But you'll never get over it completely until we get to heaven and we're reunited once again with our loved ones. Uh, stress, this election season, man, them, there's a certain group of people they're stressing out so bad right now because they don't know which way it's going to go. And I like how one newscaster put it, you know, if one side doesn't get the president they want, they're going to go on with life. The other side's going to fall to pieces. And that's the way it is. I don't understand it. But we will learn to get through things when we lean upon God. I want to encourage you tonight to do two things. And it's going to sound crazy to you to start with. First of all, I want to encourage you to thank God for whatever trial you're going through. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, can you imagine three Hebrew boys going into the fire and saying, thank you, Lord, for this fire. <laughs> or maybe Daniel going into the den of lions and thank you, Lord, for this den of lions. Or Paul and Silas, 
they were beaten with the stripes and thrown into the jail cell. Thank you, Lord, for all I've been through. We can't think about that in our human way of thinking. But when we think about the Holy Spirit's leading and guiding us, we realize that there is a lesson to be learned. God wants to teach us through our hardships and troubles. Thank God for your current situation. Hope we learn from it. And then thank God that you have what you still have. Sometimes I talk to people say, I've lost everything. And maybe they have. They got so involved in, in sin, they lost their family. Their family wouldn't have nothing to do with them. Maybe they lost their job or lost their income. They lost their self-respect. And they just lost everything. But thank God you still have what you have. And here's the thing about it with God. It's not over. He's a God of forgiveness. And as we heard just recently, my brother Landis made the comment, I believe, he's a God of not just one chance, but another chance. And so he gives us another chance. How many chances do you need? Well, God will give what you need. You know, when we come to him in sincerity and truth and, and we're honest with him, when we mess up, God still forgives us. And so thank God for what you have. Uh, in everything, Not just the good times, but the bad times. Not just the mountaintop, but the valley. In everything, give thanks. Not just good health, but bad health. Because you're still here. And if you're not here, you're going to be with the Lord. So it's going to turn out all right. Amen. Anybody got any comments, anything you want to bring up? challenge to memorize that verse. It's, it's not a hard verse to memorize. And it's a great verse to memorize. But then next week, hey, uh, what's her name? Oh, yeah. yeah. When we come back, I might have some volunteers come up here and, and recite that verse. Are you up for it? This is yes and this is yes. Okay. <laughs> In everything, give this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. That's a great verse. When you're going through things, you don't understand it, quote that verse. It'll help you. Our hearts and minds clear. Brother Albert, would you close this in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come back to your house. We thank you for the message tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to come back to your house. We thank you for the message tonight. Amen. God bless you.